Laputa Castle in the Sky is a landmark title for so many reasons. As the first film from Studio Ghibli, it played a key role in establishing what would be the most acclaimed artistic legacy in anime history. And the creative influence that it's had by itself is staggering. It is to Japanese science fantasy what The Lord of the Rings was to Western high fantasy, a template that served as the basis for countless anime and notably JRPGs. I know that it sure as hell stuck with me the first time that I watched it, and one of the most memorable things about the film for me, as I'm sure anyone familiar with my work on Mother's Basement can surmise, is the opening credits sequence. A beautiful medley of storybook animation and orchestral majesty that transforms Laputa's backstory into an arresting fairy tale. We open on an old, cracked stone carving, presumably a sign welcoming people to the city of Laputa. Regardless of its original purpose, here it serves both as a title card and a scene-setting device, instantly informing us that this tale will deal with ancient history. From here, we jump to a gorgeous shot of a goddess blowing wind through a cloudy sky, rendered in the distinctive crosshatch style of Victorian woodcut illustrations, the same kind of mass-produced illustrations you'd see in the novel novels of Jules Verne that so clearly inspired this film. Normally when you see this style of art in animation, it's on stiff, static images, but here the clouds billow naturally, subtly ruffling their cross-hatched shadows as they drift across the sky. Beautiful stuff. In the next shot, we see a lone human harnessing this power of the gods, perhaps for the first time in human history, working with some sort of wind-powered kiln. The technology only becomes more impressive from here. One windmill grows into dozens, spinning away on precarious Industrial Revolution era towers covered in cranes, pulleys, and other tools of industry. Panning down to the city's ground level, we see the wind is driving massive gears and pistons. There's a certain hypnotic beauty to the cyclical motion of the machinery, something the film itself also captures marvelously, and from what I can tell is something that inspired Miyazaki on his initial trip to Wales that served as the impetus for creating this film. But there's more to this than just steampunk animation porn. It's telling a story, the rise and fall of Laputa. These gears drive industrial shovels to bore into the earth at great speed. With the power of one force of nature under their control, the humans are claiming dominion over another. In the next shot, we see that what was once one tiny kiln has become many mountains, belching smog into the sky as the gears keep turning beneath them, presumably turning the ore from the mine into something a little more useful. Specifically, steampunk airships, with the massive windmills and industrial gears now compacted back down to human scale. But technology races forward, the airships get bigger, soon whole fleets are soaring through the skylines of towering modern-day cities. All of this building up to mankind's crowning achievement, the castle in the sky. Well, a castle in the sky, not the castle from the movie and the poster. What we see here is clearly a prototype, driven by massive propellers instead of the black dome that holds up Laputa, and with completely different, more pyramid-shaped architecture. Still, it's a sight to behold, and the music soars as the camera pulls back to show us the full majesty of what we're seeing. After toiling to break free of their earthly bonds for generations, humanity has achieved it. But one of the underlying themes of Laputa is oneness with the Earth, and as we'll shortly see, what goes up must come down. Before that, though, we see an entire fleet of floating islands, each with their own cities, castles, even lakes and farmland. From the purely industrial first model, mankind has moved on to bringing the terrestrial comforts of the ground up with them. In a single shot, the film hints at a world that stretches well beyond the bounds of the camera. While the movie itself only gave us a glimpse of the one castle, Castle, the last city remaining in the sky, here we see a full civilization of Laputa that was far beyond any of that. But it doesn't last. The storm clouds of war loom on the horizon and eventually blow away the castles and airships, leaving the survivors to abandon their homes and take to the land to rebuild. Yet the wind of fate keeps blowing, 
and in a shot mirroring the start of the OP, we see Shita living a simple, earthy farm life about to get caught up in it. The implication is clear. Humans can't shake their desire to soar above their limits. The sky will always call to them, but while we can accomplish great things, forgetting our place in the natural order only leads to repeated cycles of ruin. A point hammered home by the cut back to the action as we return to Shita plummeting from the sky. In essence, this opening sums up the entire thematic arc of the film in a minute and a half, all while expanding the world's lore and working as a captivating credit sequence. The credits aren't integrated into the action, but the use of slightly archaic, rounded kanji fits nicely with the old-timey vibe of the woodblock style, despite obviously having completely different cultural roots from the European art that we're seeing here. Though the shot composition and editing are simple, this is a gorgeous, meticulously crafted sequence that doesn't waste a single second or frame, all set to a gorgeous composition by Joe Hisaishi that would influence both the melody and texture of fantasy scores in Japan for decades to come. This opening is a micro masterpiece contained within a macro masterpiece, and a perfect sequence to set the tone for Ghibli's debut film. The success of Laputa proved that Studio Ghibli was a force to be reckoned with in the anime industry, and with their own studio firmly established, both Miyazaki and Takahata were able to enjoy creative freedom like they'd never had before. Ultimately, this would lay the groundwork for Takahata to create his most impactful and best-known film, at least from a Western perspective. Grave of the Fireflies but this video is just one part of a larger anthology project bringing together dozens of anime YouTubers to discuss Takahata's entire career. So if you want to hear the rest of that story, you're going to need to click the video link on the end card or in the doobly-doo to watch the full anthology video over on Under the Scope. By the way, on the subject of floating castles, Laputa is probably my favorite, but if you want to visit my least favorite, that would be Einkrad, Now's a good time. To celebrate the new season of Sword Art Online, Bookwalker is doing a giveaway for anyone who buys any SAO light novel or manga ebook. If you pick one up, you'll have a chance to win either a slick figure of Asuna or Sinon, or a Shikishi board signed by series creator Reki Kawahara. And if you use the promo code BASEMENT when you check out, you can get a 600 yen discount, meaning you can enter the contest for just over two bucks. Out of all the SAO books, I recommend checking out SAO Alternative, Gun Gale Online, for First, since it's actually not bad. Let me know in the comments below what you thought of this quicker approach to analyzing simpler anime OPs and if there are any other movies or shows that you think would be a good fit for it. While you're down there, don't forget to hit the subscribe button and click that link to check out the rest of the AniTuber anthology. Also, if you like the anthology, it's just the latest in a much bigger series that tackles other subjects like the Animator Expo project that spawned Be Me Me. I'm Jeff Thu, professional shitbag, signing out from my mother's basement.